Hi, everyone. I'd just like to thank Dance UK for putting on such a great conference and inviting me to speak to you. Um, I've got a lot to say, so um, I'm going to get, get going on this one. Um, but I just really wanted to start. My overview really is talking about, obviously, we're looking at optimising body composition, optimising performance, and within that, health. Um, but I just wanted to give you a bit of an overview on nutrition, performance nutrition, because from um, coming into gymnastics and coming into ballet companies, the, the pers um, I guess the dancer's perspective on seeing a nutritionist is normally, you only see a nutritionist if you've got an issue. It's normally a negative thing. Um, where actually there's a lot of things that we can do in terms of just looking at areas of performance, optimizing health, injury, um, recovery and prevention. So it's a big area. So that just to give you an overview on that, Sorry, skipped over that. And then just going to look at nutrition based on the individual's needs, looking at um, optimising physique um, and performance and the adaptations to training. So as a bit of an overview, this just gives you um, a slight picture of what, what kind of goes on. For me, performance nutrition is split into two main branches. You're looking at your good dietary practices, which forms the fundamental basis to anything that any athlete, dancer, performer should do. And then you've got the nutrition to enhance performance. Any of these areas can't be done unless you've got your good dietary practices sorted anyway. But this just looks at things like recovery, optimizing muscle adaptations, looking at enhancing um, the immune system, making sure that individuals aren't picking up illnesses and infections, um, looking at the periodization of food intake. So as Matt said, the daily fluctuations in energy intake is quite dramatic and that impacts on schedules and eating habits. So it's really making sure that individuals have got their food plan to account for different changes in training schedules. Looking at optimising body composition, as we'll talk about, and nutrient timings. But all this just gives you a bit of an indication, sleep, injury, supplements, bone health. There's a whole heap of things that you can look at from a nutrition perspective. So it's not just about body composition. So... In terms of looking at optimising body composition, optimising physique and training adaptations, when I thought about this as a whole, you've got so many different individuals within that category. So you've got the individual that needs to increase weight, that wants to put on some muscle tissue. You've got the individual that just finds it really difficult to sustain a weight um, during performance periods or competition periods or intense periods of training. They just lose weight really quickly. And then you've got the individual who just really struggles to maintain their lean physique, a lower body weight. They're constantly fighting against that. And part of that is genetics. It's always difficult for them. Um, so it's, it's looking at them as an individual. What is their main area of focus? And the nutrition aspects of that are, can be quite different, but there is also a lot of crossover between some of the elements. So if we just quickly focus on weight gain, I'm going to talk about each of them individually. The, the main one is going to be about um, optimising body composition for, for fat loss and um, um, reduction in body weight. But I do want to touch on the, the weight gain side of things. And this is just to say, really, that your training and your nutrition are fundamental. They come together. Um, you can't really get one without the other. So I get a lot of dancers that come to me um, and say that they want to put on some muscle tissue. And when I ask them about their training, they're not really doing anything geared towards enhancing that, enabling them to do that. So you've got to have the training stimulus. Nutrition does impact on muscle protein synthesis. Structuring your feeding times, your protein intakes, does stimulate muscle protein synthesis in itself. But it's not going to build muscle tissue. You need the fundamental training stimulus to do that. And so that's why connecting with the physical preparation, which Rudy's going to talk about, um, is really important in linking that up to assist with that goal. So you can't optimise physique, increase muscle tissue or get weight gain if you've not got the right nutrition manipulations in conjunction with the training stimulus. So it's really important that that's looked at as a whole. You want to be doing the training. You need to put in the nutrition to optimise that. And there you're going to get an increase in protein synthesis and an adaptation to the training and a gain in muscle tissue. So just to, just to give a, a bit more inf uh, information about this, if you're doing resistance-based training, the concept of the training that you would be doing there would cause more muscle protein breakdown. And so if you just do um, resistance training and you don't have your nutrition to support that, 
your net protein balance is going to be negative because your protein um, breakdown is always greater than your protein building. And it's not until you put in the right nutrition, you change the hormones, you provide the nutrients to help um, stimulate the repair process that you flip that into the positive balance. So I do get um, individuals that come to me and they say they've done a, um, a, a, they're doing their weight training sessions, they're doing resistance or physical prep work, and they just don't understand why they're not gaining weight and largely because they haven't got their nutrition to support what they're doing. So they're, they're not achieving their goals in that. So it's really important to look at the two. And here you look at your nutrient timings how the foods influence the hormones in the body to assist with these gains. So this is the basically to give an overview of things that promote the anabolic response to training and things that um, cause a catabolic stimulus. So just to, it's not an all-encompassing, it's just to give you an overview, but the, the anabolic stimulus um, is predominantly the training stimulus. Protein is key in that, and the leucine content. So leucine is an amino acid that stimulates muscle protein synthesis. Um, so that's what's really important, making sure that the leucine content and the protein intake is in there or after the training session to support those adaptations. Omega-3s, um, the research is still out there. Um, there's a group up in Scotland doing research into omega-3s and muscle protein synthesis. Um, so whether this can have a beneficial role in stimulating muscle protein synthesis is, um, is still up for debate, but um, some interesting work being done in that area. In terms of the catabolic stimulus, this is trying to help reduce these areas to help promote the adaptations to training. So the stress hormone responses that you get with a hard training session, heavy training sessions, particularly in the glycogen depleted state. So if you don't have any energy in the muscle, um, you get a greater, um, greater rise in your stress hormone response. And so that increases um, muscle catabolism, so muscle breakdown. Saturated fat and more... Um, Consuming saturated fat, particularly in that kind of post-training period, has a more inflammatory response and uh, impacts on muscle protein synthesis. Um, many dancers will um, come to me and tell me that they've done their training session and they're going to go out for a drink. Is that okay? No. If you've done a training session and you're consuming alcohol in that period, alcohol completely switches off muscle protein synthesis. So if you're looking for your adaptations and your repair process, you're completely blunting it if you go out and have a drink. So really looking at where's the right time to be having your alcohol consumption if you're going to be having alcohol at all. So um, oxidative stress, this happens as a natural response to metabolism um, and heavy training. And so there are new, the, part of it is required to help the muscles adapt and repair to it. So you need certain level of oxidative stress, but excessive oxidative stress can um, be uh, quite negative towards your adaptation processes. So looking at elements, nutritional elements to help support that um, with low level antioxidant intake that you would get through your natural consumption of fruits and vegetables. Um, and then naturally, if you don't put in the protein after your training session, you're going to inhibit your um, repair process. And there's a group, so Wittard um, up in uh, Scotland, their group are doing a lot of uh, work on the protein feedings, the protein timings and the quantity of protein. Um, and they showed that essentially to up to 20 grams of protein in that post-training repair period provided a maximal um, protein synthetic rate so going beyond that having 40 grams of protein wasn't necessary you didn't get any greater response in an individual up to 85 kilograms so um, I also work in rugby um, and we have individuals who are 125 kilos so very different but if you're looking at an aesthetic performer generally you've not got anyone over 85 kilos so you know, having 20 grams of protein in that post-training recovery period will optimise the muscle protein synthesis process. So there's no need for massive doses through huge supplements. You can do that through food quite easily. The key element there is then for someone trying to gain weight is to look at their muscle protein feed, uh, their muscle feedings in order to optimise the muscle protein synthesis. So you're better having smaller feedings more frequently throughout the day five times, six times, splitting that, uh, that up quite frequently as opposed to just having three big meals where you might be consuming 50 grams of protein in a meal and you're not going to utilise all of that. So you're better splitting that off into smaller portions, split in three-hour blocks throughout the day. It's a, it's a gives you a more beneficial process um, and a greater stimulus of the muscle protein um, synthesis. And this is picking up, again, what, what Matt said really is that Rest and sleep is so important for um, the body to stop, to repair, to adapt. 
um, and not having sufficient sleep. As, uh, there's a lot more research coming out about its implications on the hormones in the body and how this affects the muscle protein repair. And so if you have um, very little deep sleep, if you have um, sleep patterns that are, if you're waking up in the night and you're disrupting your sleep patterns, you do um, reduce your anabolic hormones, so your muscle building hormones, and you increase your catabolic hormones, so the, the kind of hormones that will increase muscle breakdown. And it, in turn, that all leads into um, a lack of recovery. It affects things called your, your satellite cells, which um, are involved in the muscle protein synthesis pathway. So um, you don't get as good a recovery, as good an adaptation to your training. So it's really important to focus on the sleep elements as well. And nutrition for sleep, there are, there are a lot of areas around that that you would look at, um, as well as your lifestyle factors. So it is an important consideration. A few other additional areas that you would want to consider um, would be hydration, doing a, a training session, particularly um, a strength-based session, a power-based session in the dehydrated state does increase the catabolic hormone. So that's going to work against you and it does affect power output. So again, that's not going to be beneficial for that training session. When you're looking at trying to increase muscle mass, increase um, body weight, overall energy intake is really important. Um, so I get a lot of athletes that then say to me, well, it's okay, I can just pop down to McDonald's and, uh, you know, burger and milkshake, that's fine, isn't it? No, the total energy intake is important, but the quality of that energy intake is massively important. So that will dictate whether you gain a lot of lean muscle tissue and good quality mass or whether you just gain body fat. Some individuals, they need to get, gain body fat, that's fine, but we're still looking about getting it through the right means. So it does come down to what you eat in that energy intake. But you won't gain muscle tissue if your energy intake is less than what you're always um, using throughout the day. Your muscle glycogen stores, so your muscle energy stores, is how you store carbohydrate. That's really important for uh, um, the kind of strength-based, power-based work. And so that will impact on your ability to, to do an intense session if your muscle energy stores are low. So really looking at your carbohydrate intake um, around your training sessions. And the other one um, is vitamin D. So there's a lot more research come out about um, vitamin D receptors in the muscle tissue. And um, if you are deficient in vitamin D, the impact that this has on muscle strength um, causing muscle weakness. So that is an area to, to think about. So you, there's a lot to think about with weight gain um, and individuals who need to put on body, body weight. But ultimately eating clean is massively important. If we're looking at preventing weight loss, then there's a number of different factors that come into play here. So I have um, a couple of individuals who um, actually really surprised me when they told me their, their food intake and their overall calorie intake. Um, at first, I didn't, I didn't quite believe them. It amazed me that they were eating this much and they were still struggling to to maintain their weight and their weight was already only 49 kilos. Like it was, they were eating a lot. And so for individuals like that, they really struggle. And then when they go into intense periods, when they're away on performances, it's so difficult for them to maintain weight. Um, so that is a challenge. Some people have that challenge. It seems to any normal person that that's, that's not such a difficult challenge for yourself. You would just want to eat all the time. Um, but actually it becomes quite laborious. They have to eat constantly. Trying to get that energy in is just, it becomes a chore. So that's difficult to overcome with some individuals. And then you've got some individuals who just, they lose weight largely because of stress, busy schedules. That makes it quite difficult for them to get the energy in. So you saw on Matt's slide with the, some of the sessions where, you know, on a day they might be burning 4,000 calories. Well, in that day, obviously, a lot of that time is spent in training. And so trying to get the energy in and around that to help support that energy intake is quite, can be quite difficult for some individuals. And particularly when you don't want to put in large volumes and have that feeling of fullness or bloatedness or feeling heavy. So you've kind of got to match things up in terms of how the individual feels, what the, um, how many gaps you've got in the day and where you can fit the energy in. For some individuals, actually, the perception of what they're eating isn't as as big as what um, actually they're eating. So they think they're eating a lot. Um, but when you look at it, there's a lot more areas that you would work on in terms of boosting the energy intake because it's not as large as what you would want them to be having for those um, for those training days. So sometimes their perception is, is a little bit mismatched. 
And then you have an issue of a loss of appetite. So with heavy training schedules, hard training sessions, that does suppress your appetite. So it makes it very difficult for individuals who are trying to prevent weight loss, getting the energy in because they just don't feel hungry. They don't want to eat. So in terms of tackling all these areas, it is really important then to really structure it. Plan that out. What are the training sessions? Where can you fit the foods in? What are the right foods to get in? Whether that's a solid food, a liquid food, because you've only got a short period. If you've got a 15 minute break, you're not going to eat a massive meal. You just want a quick liquid energy source that's going to get into your system quite quickly, digest and not make you feel full and bloated. So you've got to look at really structuring that out. And um, then the gymnast, the dancer, the performer, the athlete trying to stick to that and have that regardless of whether they have an appetite or not because that's not going to dictate their energy requirements. As I said before, liquid energy sources can be really useful for individuals who struggle with appetite or have busy schedules. So making up homemade high energy smoothies, bananas, Greek yogurt, milk, berries, those kind of things, mixing in porridge oats. You can make some really good liquid energy sources um, just to get that, that kind of energy into them quite quickly. So they can be really useful and also high energy foods. So nuts and seeds are really great for this. You can boost someone's energy intake quite, quite easily with, with such a small volume, um, which is always good with a, with a dancer or someone who's going to put on a leotard, a swimming suit and, and doesn't want to feel too heavy, too full and bloated. Um, in, uh, incorporating things like avocados, olives, olive oil, um, oily fish, those are already useful foods to have in a, a, on a regular basis just to boost energy, energy intake and making sure that it's still nutrient-dense foods. So there's a, there's a whole heap of things that you would want to think about and just reiterating to them that um, if this is an issue, then you've got to eat regardless of your appetite. So um, that's just a really quick whistle stop tour around an individual who struggles with maintaining weight um there's a lot more i'm sure to talk about that one but um we're going to move on to the weight and fat loss it's a big area um and one of the biggest issues that um i have is looking at the justification for weight loss and making sure that that is matched with what's achievable So I'm just going to show you a little bit of information here in order to, I don't know, form your own views on whether the individual needs to lose weight. If they need to lose weight, how much weight would they be losing? I've got two athletes and they're both 13 years old. One is 54 kilos and one is 32 kilos. I don't know if anyone's already made a judgment there on on these two individual athletes, but you'll have your own um, image in your mind there. Athlete number one is 161 centimetres. Athlete number two is 145. So clearly we've got massive differences in maturation. There's a huge difference in their height there. Athlete number one, as determined by a DEXA scan, is 11% body fat. Female at 11% body fat, yeah, she's only 13, but she's she's lean. Um, athlete number two, 14% body fat, still very lean female. When we look at total kilograms of fat mass, uh, athlete number one is 5.9, which is, that's incredibly lean. Um, obviously, athlete number two is much smaller in stature and so has less body fat, but is still very lean, 4.6 kilograms of body fat. <laughs> When you look at the muscle tissue, athlete number one has 45.5 kilos of muscle tissue, like practically 20 kilos more muscle than athlete number two with only what 1.3 kilos more body fat. So huge differences. Obviously, athlete number one, it has matured a lot. She's very strong. She's a robust girl. She's very powerful. Um, And when you look at their fat to height ratio to try and take away the element of their differences in physique, they're very similar. So when you look at these individuals, would you be saying either of them need to lose weight? I'm hoping not. Um, (laughs) Both of them are 13, so they're growing, they're changing, their bodies are changing. Athlete number one is, is actually a very strong, a very powerful, a very robust athlete. Athlete number two, um, not so much. She hasn't been able to compete for the last two years because of different injuries. 
So, but the natural perception is that athlete number two, physique wise, is a better physique. Um, so it's trying to look at the individual. The physiques is, is a perception, a judgment, but looking at actual key data to determine do either of these individuals need to lose weight? The answer is clearly no. Is there someone in their lives that wants one of the athletes to lose weight? Yes, there is. And so you're looking at this individual and you're saying, well, if she's going to lose weight, how are you going to get weight <laughs> off her? Where is that going to come from? Because you can't lose any more body fat. If you're going to lose weight, you're going to be losing muscle tissue. There you're going to impact on power output and the strength and potentially the injury of the um, injury risk of the athlete. When we look at their Z scores, athlete number one is 3.3. Athlete number two, minus 0.1. So quite a difference, but because Z scores with um, uh, with adolescence is quite a, um, a difficult one to do, uh, establish, there is um, you can calculate that and adjust for height. But even if you adjust for height, athlete number one was 2.8 and athlete number two was 0.8. So yes, athlete number two is in the, the normal realms for, for bone for a normal individual. But this girl is not a normal individual. She has heavy training loads, high stresses through the skeletal system, and she does have a bone injury. So clearly bone health is something that needs to be worked on. I'm not going to touch too much on bone health because we have the session this afternoon that will be really interesting. Um, but obviously there's a, there's a key area in terms of energy intake, growth, maturation, bone strength that needs to be addressed. Um, so my, my thing with that is just really looking, do you have the data to show that someone needs to lose weight? If they need to lose weight, how much weight is feasible to be lost? So just a, another quick example, um, one of our other athletes, she would be a similar height um, as athlete number one. She's around 165 centimetres. Um, she's 58 kilos and she carries 12 kilos of body fat. So is there room for movement with that individual? Yes, there is. Can we do that safely and know how much um, body fat we can lose from that person and set an appropriate weight? Yes, we can because we have the data. The issue is when someone is told to lose weight and a number is given based on a round figure, you're 56 kilos, I want you to be 50 kilos. Is, is that achievable? You don't know until you've got the data to show what's a, an achievable change in body mass. So I think that's really important when you're looking at telling an athlete or an individual that they need to lose weight. You need to have the data to show what's a good justification for that weight change. So you've got the energy balance equation. So a lot of people will say, well, do you know, obviously energy in, energy out. If you're still carrying too much body fat, then you're not reducing your energy intake sufficiently. And you have, I have a couple of dancers who try their hardest, they eat so well, um, and they do everything that we plan out, and they really struggle to reduce weight in line with where individuals want them to be. And that for them is very difficult, because psychologically, they think when they're dancing that people are looking at them going... They must be secretly eating. They're not doing everything right. They're not following the plan that the nutritionist has given them. It's just really hard. They're fighting a weight that's not natural for them. It's really difficult. You've got some individuals that can just eat anything, any old rubbish, and they just don't put weight on. It's really difficult for the people who struggle to, to reduce weight because the energy balance equation isn't that simple. One calorie is not the same from all different types of foods. They have different impacts on your satiety hormones, so hormones that make you feel full, um, and then hormones that regulate your appetite, so your leptin and your ghrelin. So they're important aspects to consider. They have different impacts on hormones that store, um, store body fat, so you've got a different implication on your insulin, and you'll all probably be aware of the, the glycemic index, the impact that a food has on blood sugar levels and insulin responses. So 100 calories from white bread is very different to 100 calories from butternut squash. You've got a very high GI food, you've got a very low GI food. You've got white bread that is not particularly nutritious. Yes, it contains calcium, but it doesn't have a great nutrient profile. Whereas you've got butternut squash with its whole heap of different nutrients, vitamin A, vitamin E, or your beta carotenes. Um, so it's a, it's a very different response. You've got an energy a, um, a nutrient rich food with a low GI and you've got a low nutrient food with a high GI. Different implications on satiety <laughs> hormones, feeling of fullness and your insulin response. 100 calories from sugar is very different to 100 calories from um, a high quality protein like turkey. 
So you've got pure sugar, really high GI food, um, and you've got protein, which has um, a very different response to insulin, um, and it has a greater thermogenic response. So it takes more energy to, to break down, absorb the nutrients um, that you get from, from protein as opposed to pure sugar. So it is important to look at what the person is eating as opposed to just saying energy in, energy out. When we look at insulin, just a quick one, its primary function is to promote um, uh, storage of, the, of blue glucose. So any carbohydrates that you absorb, the primary focus is insulin will then push that out of the blood and push it into storage areas. You can only store glucose, carbohydrates in the muscle and in the liver. When those areas are full, it has to be put somewhere else. So it has to be pushed into storage locations, in which case it's converted into very inefficiently, but it's converted into body fat. So it does promote it inhibits lipolysis so it inhibits the breakdown of um, fatty acids and it promotes the synthesis and the storage of triglycerides so fat so it is important to look at the types of foods the types of carbohydrates that someone is eating so we could just talk about that quickly but i just want to mention when we're looking at optimizing weight changes um, it is important to look at a whole realm of things. Nutrient timings, at what time the foods are coming in, around training sessions at certain times of the day, the food quality, and the periodization. I'm not going to talk about periodization, but um, it did, did show from, from Matt's um, graphs how that varies quite considerably on, on different days. And what I find with all the athletes that I've worked with, that when they have a busy day and a really energy demanding day, that's where normally where energy intake is at its lowest. People don't have time, they're not prepared. Um, they don't wanna, they lose their appetite. And then you've got a rest day, Sunday when you're not doing anything and suddenly energy intake is massive. So it's really mismatched in comparison to training demands. So when we look at nutrient timings, um, trying to fit in energy intake earlier in the day has a much better response on body composition um, than backloading. And so trying to get a breakfast, which you'll probably know, or if you're an athlete, a gymnast, a dancer yourself, um, that a lot of people tend to skip breakfast. So this does have implications. But trying to push energy intake forward, there is a study showing that 50% more energy earlier on in your breakfast meal has a much better impact on um, body composition, even if energy intake is the same as opposed to when that's flipped around and that that energy is, intake, uh, is taken in at the end of the day. So ideally, pushing energy intake forward helps give the energy to train, support the training sessions, promote recovery, and then easing off at the end of the day when less carbohydrate is needed in the evening. And this will depend on schedules. Granted, some people train late into the evening, so it is looking at different schedules. But this way around is associated with more fat storage, regardless of whether the energy content of the diet is the same. But the other issues that you get with this is that someone might get up in the morning, go straight into training. Um, they get through that training session, fine, but then they've got to go into the next training session. They're still not eating very much, and now they're feeling a bit tired. They've used up their energy stores in the muscle. Um, as we've talked about, any kind of power-based sport, ballet, gymnastics, um, they're very power-based, and so you're using a lot of carbohydrates. Any anaerobic sport, you're synchro swimming, um, you're using a lot of carbohydrates in those, in those sports. So if you've utilised your energy carbo carbohydrates, um, then you've, you've got very little to work with in your next session. So coming to your next training session, you don't have as good a quality training session. Um, I get a lot of dancers tell me that when they're pirouetting, they, um, they lose their focus and actually they get quite dizzy and some people have actually black, blacked out slightly. They feel like they black out in their pirouettes. Well, that's you know really dangerous if you're on point doing pirouettes and you black out. Um, so don't have the energy in the day and then suddenly blood sugar levels drop, cravings kick in, you get really hungry. And this is typical of any of you have ever done it, you've missed a few meals and suddenly you're just like, oh my God, get the food into me. Um, we've all done it, I've done it. And you get home, you start putting food into you, you're cooking your dinner. Suddenly you're just shoving your dinner in, bearing in mind it takes time for the hormones of the body to be released into your brain, to get through the circulation into your brain so you realise that you're full. So you overeat and then you finish that meal and you suddenly realise you've eaten a massive meal, you've eaten a load of snacks that you probably wouldn't have normally eaten. You've probably eaten a lot of rubbish in those snacks as well because you've picked them up as you're just grabbing and going. Um, and then you feel a bit guilty about it. Then you start thinking, oh, I shouldn't have eaten that much. Now I feel bad, I feel full, I feel heavy, this isn't good. So the way you'll deal with that is that you won't eat in the morning, you'll skip breakfast. 
And so you then start this spiral of negative eating patterns and that's how we create disordered eating patterns. And in that simplistic stage, that can be easily dealt with if you can change the the nutrient timing. So it is important to look at your nutrient timings and when these fit around training sessions. Food quality, as I've said before, this has a massive impact. You've got to look at the nutrient-dense foods as opposed to the energy-dense foods that have, will have a big implication on, on body weight and body fat storage. But a lot of people have a negative concept of carbohydrates, that we can't have carbs, it's going to lead to weight gain. It's not about no carbs, particularly in training sessions where you're using predominantly carbohydrates. It's about the right types of carbs. So less of your heavily processed carbs, your white bread, your white pasta, your white quick cooked rice, less of those kind of things in sugary products. More about your butternut squash, your sweet potatoes, your whole grains, your fruits, your lentils, your beans, those kind of carbs. Um, And this does come down to the glycemic index and the impact, as I explained before, on the the insulin response and therefore um, fat storage. So I often say to my athletes that we'll look at different types of carbohydrates at different times. So if we were just looking at a general day, I would be focusing more on breakfast carbs based around whole porridge oats, Um, granary bread, fruit, yogurts, milk, those kind of carbohydrates. If I'm looking at lunchtime, then I'll try and categorize something with something from group one, something from group two. So something like whole wheat giant couscous with chickpeas, like a Moroccan style dish like that, or something like a wheat berry and black bean curry with sweet potatoes and chicken, that kind of combining the different carbohydrates so you get um, a different element there and then looking at dinner carbs and going to the really low um, glycemic index side of things so looking at things like your quinoa your butternut squash your beans your lentils edamame beans those sorts of things so looking at different carbs at different times helps an athlete sort of structure those kind of things out Fats, a lot of people want to avoid fats, but actually we really need fats, particularly for our fat-soluble vitamins, vitamin D particularly, um, which is uh, implications on, on bone health, but um, or for wound healing, for repair of tissues. So it is important that we get the right types of fats in. So again, looking at the quality of the fats that you're, you're consuming. Nuts, seeds, oily fish, olives, avocados, those kind of options. Same's true about the quality of the protein. So when an athlete comes and tells me that they're going to go and get their protein from McDonald's, that's not where we want to be looking at getting your protein from. That has a big implication. So we want to look at high-quality proteins, lean chicken, eggs, low-fat dairy, lean red meat, trying to avoid your processed um, proteins. So your chorizo, your salami, your chicken nuggets, your sausages, all those kind of things. So really looking at food quality in all the different areas will have a big impact. Now this, my one of two obligatory graphs, I think, um, is just goes to show um, the overall um, uh, energy intake and how this is split off. So regardless of overall energy intake, if this is 2,000 calories or 3,000 calories, The point is that your resting metabolic rate accounts for a large proportion of your energy usage. There will be a small, um, around 10% uh, effect of the thermic effect of food, so the amount of energy that is then used to digest and absorb and transport nutrients. And you can see the difference really between the sedentary and the athlete is that there's a massive proportion of uh, energy used for training in itself. So that's what's, what changes the, the usage in terms of resting metabolic rate. But the point is, it's quite significant. Your resting metabolic rate is important. So what happens when you suddenly cut energy intake? You have an adaptive response. So your energy intake is up here. Suddenly you have a fad diet or you want to quickly change body weight. You chop energy intake and suddenly your resting metabolic rate is going to reduce to that. That can happen within four to five days. It's an adaptive response. It's going to happen. So you reduce your metabolic rate. So now for any exercise, any anything you're doing throughout the day, you're going to burn less energy and because your body's trying to conserve that energy. Um, and... Camps tell, um, they show that if in, a, in a period of weight, of weight loss, um, this intervention, the, the impact that this has on resting metabolic rate actually um, went on despite increasing the energy intake back to normal levels. Their resting metabolic rate was suppressed for a year after the intervention. So it has implications. So if you calorie restrict 
this is going to impact on particularly depending on how you do this if you don't do this correctly quick energy cuts and quick weight loss is going to result in a loss of muscle tissue anyone who comes to you and says oh brilliant i did this uh liquid food diet just on soups and um i've lost five kilograms in two days well you've probably lost a lot of water and a lot of a lot of muscle tissue in that muscle is your metabolically active tissue which dictates your meta- um, your resting metabolic rate so if you're losing muscle that's going to have an impact and then you've got your metabolic alterations this adaptive thermogenesis so you become more energy efficient within that and that is going to impact on your resting metabolic rate so if your resting metabolic rate is lower you're going to burn less energy for anything that you're doing so this has important important implications when you're looking at weight loss reducing body fat in an individual i'm not going to talk too much about this we've got this this afternoon but um, i can't really do a presentation on nutrition and not talk about energy availability So energy availability is the amount of energy that's left for the body to use once you've taken away the energy used for um, training, for exercise, for any activities that you're doing within the day. So um, to maintain um, reproductive function and to maintain health, around 45 um, kilocalories per kilogram of fat-free mass is where you you sort of base that. If you fall below 30 calories per kilogram of fat-free mass, Um, then you get implications on um, luteinizing hormone pulsatility um, and estrogen um, that is uh, circulating around the body. So if you're affecting your luteinizing hormone um, and you're affecting estrogen levels, you're going to have impacts on bone. So you increase bone breakdown and bone resorption as opposed to bone formation. So you've got an, an issue there. If you're telling someone to reduce energy intake and they chop that too much and it impacts on the energy availability, when the energy availability is low, you're impacting on menstrual function in females. This does impact on males in terms of their testosterone levels and has been shown to impact on males' um, uh, uh, bone health. It's just a lot more obvious when you do it in a female because the first thing to go when they don't have enough energy is that they don't have a, a menstrual cycle if they've already started their menstrual cycle. And so the impact that this has on bone health has been shown to be related to the length at which that individual loses their menstrual cycle. So if someone has started a menstrual cycle and then suddenly stops for seven months, that period is quite key as opposed to if they've started and they stop for one or two months. So looking at the length, the duration in in which they don't have a menstrual cycle is really important. But something that we're looking at in gymnastics um, is looking at the age at which they start their menstrual cycle. So if you've got an individual that starts their menstrual cycle at 15 or they still haven't started and they're 16 or they're still going on and they're 17 and they're still not starting the menstrual cycle, this has been shown to be linked with um, fracture risk um, and bone-related injuries. So it is important to have systems in place to be assessing when someone is starting their menstrual cycle and if they haven't started, what investigations need to be looked at um, in terms of getting things going in that area. Um, Naturally, when your energy intakes are too low, this does compromise a number of other different areas. So you've got an impact on the training quality, so whether they can actually sustain the intensity of training that's required of them during that period um, can be quite difficult. When energy intake is too low, this does cause symptoms of depression. So an individual who is more susceptible to this might start having more issues in terms of their perception of themselves, um, their body image. And so, and that's a simple correction of energy and gene input. Um, obviously, it's a lot more complex than that. I'm not trying to um, play that one down, but the, there is an element of just low energy intakes on depression and um, body dissatisfaction. Naturally, when energy intakes are low, nutrient intake is also very difficult. So even if you have a really high nutrient intake um, diet where all the foods that you eat count and you're not um, taking in empty calories from sweets, from sports drinks, from chocolate, then it's still really difficult to get a lot of your micronutrients, so your vitamins and minerals. So it does compromise nutrient intake, which has implications on all aspects of the body, whether that's bone health, whether that's immune function, um, whether that's uh, iron status. So it is really important when you're looking at reducing energy intake, if that's how things are going, that things are planned out so you make sure you're optimising your nutrient intake to get all of your micronutrients in. And then you've got the impact that low energy intakes has on immune function and injury of, um, risk of injury. 
So when energy intakes are low, as I said before, this increase this causes an increase in the catabolic hormones, um, which will impact on immune function. And then if someone is, as I said, blacking out when they're pirouetting because they don't have the energy and they've lost concentration, then naturally you've got that issue in terms of the risk of injury. In gymnastics, if we've got someone trying to do a really um, very skillful uh, performance on beam and they haven't got the energy and they're not concentrating, then the risk of injury is quite high and that can be quite a severe injury. So those things need to be considered. In terms of trying to maintain muscle mass, so as I said, if you cut energy intake, you can reduce, um, you can lose muscle tissue quite quickly. So trying to maintain that through higher protein intakes is important through the maintenance of um, resistance-based work to help stimulate muscle protein synthesis um, will, be, will be important. And resistance-based work, as Rudy's going to talk to you about, is, is very good in terms of the metabolic impact that that has. Looking at high satiety foods, so <laughs> things that are high in fibre, high in protein, low GI, um, will be important when trying to get a greater weight loss um, and optimising physique, but healthily. So um, you shouldn't have your, your athlete, your dancer, coming to you saying that they're absolutely starving. That's not a position that they should be in. Um, and I've had that recently, and it's, it's quite uncomfortable, and they shouldn't be in that position. So... Um, there was a bit of um, research earlier about um, dairy, how dairy might impact on fat metabolism um, and impact on body composition. The recent analysis of this is that, that maybe it doesn't increase fat loss, but certainly dairy, low-fat dairies, is really good because it's a rich source of leucine, which is the major stimulator of muscle protein synthesis. Um, it's a really good source of just general protein for an individual. It, ha it has a higher satiety, so it helps someone feel fuller for longer. Um, and naturally, then you're hitting calcium. So uh, the thing that I push with all of my gymnasts is that immediately post-training, they're drinking milk. They're going to get recovery of the muscles. They're going to get recovery for the bones. They're getting a fluid intake to help with hydration. Um, so it's all-encompassing. It's a cheap way to get a good recovery. <laughs> Now, in gymnastics, um, we do a lot more high-intensity interval training, which is designed to assist with both fitness and um, optimising physique. So the benefits of the high-intensity interval training is a session that you can do in short duration, um, 20 minutes, 25 minutes. It can be done pretty quickly. Um, so it's not impacting on every other training session going on, but it is a hard session, so it does need to be thought about. But it's going to improve um, the cardiovascular fitness of the individual, which should translate into their performance. Um, if they're fitter when they go into their training sessions, that's going to help. It is glycogen depleting training, which, as I'll show you in a little bit, has implications on mitochondrial biogenesis so the synthesis of new mitochondria in the tissue which has implications on overall fat metabolism carbohydrate metabolism the ability to utilize energy during training sessions it shocks the body doing the same training day in day out you become accustomed to that your body becomes accustomed to it so it's trying to shock the body do something different that it's not used to and high intensity interval training is pretty good at doing this um, and overall, you can get a massive um, energy, um, like a, you can use quite a lot of energy in these sort of training sessions without going on for hours and hours, sitting on a bike, working at a really low intensity. So short, sharp, um, energy demanding sessions that can be really useful. I'm going to flip over that one. But essentially, for anyone who looks into cellular metabolism, I'm sorry for really simplifying this, but it shows that when you do exercise of this nature, high-intensity interval training, if you do this in a glycogen-depleted state, so you do it first thing in the morning when the person hasn't eaten, this has big implications on um, something called AMP-ATP ratio. So it stimulates a metabolic pathway, which ultimately is going to have um, better implications on mitochondrial biogenesis and angiogenesis. So mitochondrial biogenesis is simply the development of new mitochondria in the tissue. Angiogenesis is the development of new capillaries within the tissue, so you can increase oxygen delivery to the muscle. So if you can increase these factors quite quickly and quite simply by doing the training in a glycogen-depleted state, you get a better response. You're going to have a greater impact on the ability to utilise energy and utilise fats um, when you're do, um, at doing training. So all in all, this helps fitness and it helps with body composition. So 
Um, it's it's a good thing to incorporate into training, but it does need to be planned in. Doing this, you can't just ask someone to do this every morning of the day uh, each week. Um, that will have implications on on their training. So trying to look at where that might fit in in terms of their their scheduling in a in a week. And on the flip side, so we talked about sleep in terms of building muscle tissue. If you get a lack of sleep, that does impact on things like your appetite, your levels of fatigue, um, and your, your glucose metabolism. So this has implications on body weight. And what a lot of the research is showing is if you've got an individual who isn't sleeping very well, is having disrupted sleep, um, then they tend to store more body fat. It's a lot more difficult for them to change body composition. So that is an area that you would want to be considering in terms of uh, weight management. So sleep is important. So to try and wrap all of that up quite quickly, I know that's a lot that I've just thrown at you, but it is important to look at food quality and nutrient timings first, um, trying to focus on those nutrient dense foods and the types of carbohydrates that are used at different meal times, as opposed to just blanket, cut energy, you shouldn't be eating that much energy. So really focus on those kind of things. You've got to look at the thermic effect of foods. So protein has a greater thermogen um, thermogenic response. So higher protein intakes help maintain muscle um, and will be better in terms of um, a weight management strategy. And higher satiety foods, so high fiber, higher protein foods would be good for that. Um, generally keeping dairy, a low fat dairy intake up is, is good because it's good for the elements in terms of muscle recovery, calcium intake. Um, Impact on, on fat metabolism, probably not, but it's still a useful food to, to keep up. The high intensity interval training and physical prep work is important. You can't just ask someone to change body weight, lose fat through diet alone in individuals that have already probably got a very low energy intake anyway. In some individuals, I actually have to bring the energy intake up and we have to go up in weight in order to come down because they've been on such a low energy intake for so long. They can't change physique, they can't change body composition and they've been yo-yo dieting more and more. And so they've got a greater fat storage. So it becomes really difficult to try and change body composition for them. So we actually have to go up before we can come down, which is hard for someone to deal with. Um, but the high interval uh, training and the physical prep work is really important in allowing them to, to achieve the, the right body composition goals. And then focusing good, sufficient, good quality sleep. So just quickly, I'm just going to run you through. This is what we put together with, with Rudy, like a day in the life of a gymnast. This is how we work in terms of coaches. But essentially, we get up first thing in the morning and we'll do our high intensity interval training on a, on a bike to offload. They'll then eat a good quality breakfast. For gymnasts, they're young, they go to school. So they're off to school. They take a snack with them, a big bottle of water, some dried fruit, nuts, um, to snack on throughout the morning they'll have a good quality lunch um, trying to make lunch a big meal of the day as well as their breakfast they'll be in school for the afternoon their parents will race them home get them some food pretty quickly before taking them to the gym and the ideal time is to get them to eat their dinner before they come into training sessions it's difficult but if the parents are prepared um, and uh, have this already planned out then it, it can be easily done so they can eat before they come into gym sessions They'll do their gymnastics training, and then if they didn't fit their um, cycling work in, the high-intensity interval training, we can do that at the end of the day. They'll do the physical prep work, depending, so this will just be um, structured uh, accordingly to their, their training schedule. And then they're going to recover with milk, with some fruit, some high antioxidant fruits, um, and then they're going to go home. And depending on that individual's body composition strategy will be whether they eat again at home or what they eat again when they get home. But the idea is that we haven't taken any energy intake out, we've pushed it forwards. So they get more energy throughout the day, they get a better energy response and um, a higher quality training session, they're able to do more work and they have a better impact on body composition. So just a simple structure like that, but that probably gives you a little bit of an overview of how we work then in gymnastics. So just quickly, um, the requirements, you've got to look at the individual. Do they need weight gain? Do they need to try and um, prevent weight loss? Or do they need to lose weight and body fat? How can you do this through a combination of training and nutrition? It can't just be done through nutrition. It has to be encompassing the training aspect. Um, and so you've got to look at those areas that I spoke about, the, the timings and, and nutrient intakes. And it is a team approach, so you need the support of strength and conditioning or a physical um a, a trainer who's going to look at the, the kind of physical element as well as the nutritionist and the coach or the dance teacher it's a and the physio it's like a whole team approach so the more people you can get on board with that the better the response 
Um, thank you very much. That was a lot. Sorry. <laughs>